God of day and God of darkness, now we stand before the night. As the shadows stretch and deepen, come and make our darkness bright. All creation still is groaning for the dawning of your might. When the sun of peace and justice fills the earth with radiant light. Praise to you in day and darkness you are source and you are end. Praise to you who loves and nurtures like a father, mother, friend. Grant us all a peaceful resting. Let each mind and body mend. So we rise refresh tomorrow, hearts renewed to kingdom ten. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And, and with, with your, your spirit. spirit. My dear friends, as we gather around the altar of our God, I certainly send out my greetings on behalf of myself, Father Clark, Deacon Boo, Deacon Luis, and all of us here at Divine Mercy Parish. For those who are watching, our parishioners, whether by internet or certainly um, by another means of communication, we certainly send you our prayers this day. As we gather around the Lord's altar, as we continue our Lenten journey, and so, my dear friends, to prepare our hearts and minds to enter this most sacred mystery, let us take a moment this day to acknowledge our sins. For the times we fail to follow God's holy will in our own lives, for the times we fail to be faithful to the call and command of the gospel, for the times in which we have failed to walk the call of discipleship. For these times, my friends, we ask our Heavenly Father for pardon, for peace, and for forgiveness. Lord Jesus, your mighty God and Prince of Peace, Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Lord Jesus, Son of God, and Son of Mary, Christ have mercy. Christ have mercy. And Lord Jesus, your word made flesh and splendor of the Father, Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Let us pray. By your help, we beseech you, Lord our God, may we walk eagerly in that same charity with which, out of love for the world, your Son handed himself over to death. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Ezekiel. Thus says the Lord God, O my people, I will open your graves and have you rise from them and bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and have you rise from them, O my people. I will put my spirit in you that you may live, and I will settle you upon your land. Thus you shall know that I am the Lord. I have promised, and I will do it, 
says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, to be to God. With the Lord there is mercy and fullness of redemption. With the Lord there is mercy and fullness of redemption. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my voice in supplication. With the Lord there is mercy and fullness of redemption. If you, O oh Lord, mark inequities, Lord, who can stand? But with you is forgiveness that you may be revealed. We the Lord there is mercy and fullness of redemption. I trust in the Lord, my soul trusts in his word. Make the sentinels wait for the dawn. Let Israel wait for the Lord. With the Lord there is mercy and fullness of redemption. For with the Lord is kindness and with him is plenteous redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all their iniquities. With the Lord there is mercy and fullness of redemption. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh. On the contrary, you are in the Spirit, if only the Spirit of God dwells in you. Whoever does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is alive because of righteousness. If the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit dwelling in you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God, Lord 
resurrection and the life sends the Lord. Whoever believes in me will never die. Glory to you, word of God, Lord Jesus Christ. Glory to you, word of God, the Lord be with you and with your spirit a reading from the Holy Gospel according to John glory to you O Lord now a man was ill Lazarus from Bethany the village of Mary and his sister Martha Mary was the one who had anointed the Lord with perfume oil and dried his feet with her hair. And it was her brother Lazarus who was ill. So the sisters sent word to him, saying, Master, the one you love is ill. When Jesus heard this, he said, This illness is not to end in death, but is for the glory of God. Then the Son of God will be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and, his, and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was ill, he remained for two days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just trying to stone you and you want to go back there? But Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in a day? If one walks during the day, he does not stumble, but he sees the light of the world. But if one walks at night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. He said this and then told them, our friend Lazarus is asleep and I'm going to awaken him. Master, is he asleep? he will be saved. But Jesus was talking about his death, while they thought he meant ordinary sleep. So then Jesus said to them clearly, Lazarus has died, and I am glad for you that I was not there, that you may believe. Let us go to him. So Thomas, called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go to die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, only about two miles away. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she said she went to meet him. But Mary sat at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know, whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise. Martha said to him, I know he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I have come to believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, the one who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary secretly, saying, the teacher is here and is asking for you. As soon as she had heard this, she rose quickly and went to him. For Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still where Martha had met him. So when the Jews who were with her in the house, comforting her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out, they followed her, presuming that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet 
and said to him, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her weeping, he became perturbed and deeply troubled and said, where have you laid him? They said to him, sir, come and see. And Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, come not, could not the one who opened the eyes of the blind man had not done something so that this man would not have died? So Jesus perturbed again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone laid across it. Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha, the dead man's sister, said to him, Lord, by now there will be stench. He has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that you believe you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you for hearing me. I know that you always hear me. Because of the crowd here, I have said this, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, tied hands and foot with burial bands, and his face was wrapped in a cloth. So Jesus said to them, untie him and let him go. Now many of the Jews who had come to Mary and seen what he had done began to believe in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. My brothers and sisters in the Lord, what would be your dream job? Maybe you have a job right now that is one in which you wish you had another. Maybe you're retired now, and maybe you had wished that you had another experience. And so, my brothers and sisters, there are many in our community this day who wish they just had a job. Certainly giving the economic fears and worries, layoffs and fur furloughs with the coronavirus pandemic. But if you had the question asked you, what would be your dream job, how would you answer? I was reading a few nights ago that in February of 2018, the British royal family put out a want to add. They put out a job description. They needed to hire someone. And they needed to hire a digital communication officer. Now, my brothers and sisters, in this time of virtual ministry, Father Cooper needs a digital communication officer. Because he doesn't know how to work any of this stuff. But you know what, my brothers and sisters? God always provides. And so the queen, the queen needed a digital communications officer. And as part of the job description... The individual was in charge of all of the queen's social media accounts. Her YouTube videos, Facebook, Instagram, in order to present everything about the queen's life and about the queen's duties. The pay was 30,000 pounds, about $38,000. And as part of the job description, it read this. The queen was looking for someone who was innovative, and had a creative flair. Someone who was fast paced and could work with a dynamic team. Now that caught me, my brothers and sisters, because I want to focus a minute on our first reading from the prophet Ezekiel. And I wonder, my brothers and sisters, was the prophet Ezekiel considered to be innovative with a creative flair? Probably not. Because you know, my brothers and sisters, God does not call the qualified. God qualifies the called. 
And Ezekiel was called not so much for his ability, not so much for his skill set, but Ezekiel was called for his obedience to be the prophet, to be the mouthpiece. And was Ezekiel used to working in a fast-paced and dynamic team? I don't think so, my brothers and sisters, because being a prophet was a very lonely life. It was also a very difficult life. Because in many ways, my brothers and sisters, individuals wanted to kill the prophets. Because the prophet had a word to speak to them from God. And oftentimes, my friends, it was a challenging word. And oftentimes, we do not want to hear a challenging word. To so the life of Ezekiel was probably a lonely life. It was a difficult life. But he said yes to the Lord. You see, my brothers and sisters, if you think the job or the description of being a prophet is easy, when you go out, say to someone something of a truth that is contained in the gospel and end the sentence by saying something uh, to the extent that it is in accordance with God's will. It is in accordance with God's word. It's in accordance with what God has prophesied, what God has said. And oftentimes, my friends, somebody's going to want to punch you in the nose. But don't worry about it, my friends, because now we have six feet of social distancing, so they can't reach you right now. The prophet, a dangerous job. There's an age-old story of a medieval Jewish astrologer whose name was Moshi. And Moshi prophesied one day that the king's prize horse was going to die. And a few days later, the horse did die. And the king was very upset. So he called Moshi before him in the royal palace with all the court around him. And the king asked Moshi a question. He said, Moshi, I want you to prophesy. When are you going to die? Now Moshe knew that whatever he answered, the king was ready to kill him. And so Moshe was a smart man. He said to the king, King, I do not know when I'm going to die, but I do know this. Whenever I do die, the king is going to die three days later. Moshe lived a very long life. Being a prophet, my brothers and sisters, is very important. And you see, my brothers and sisters, the prophet has one job. One task, one calling. And the job, the task, the calling, the mission, the ministry of the prophet is to speak for God. To be the mouthpiece for God. And that's what Ezekiel does. That's what all the prophets do. And many times, my brothers and sisters, God has something to say to us that is not very comfortable. God has something to say to us that is challenging. I don't know if you know this, but when a person is freezing to death, they get this nice sensation in their body. As they're freezing to death, death, there's a pleasant numbness that comes over them. And they begin to quietly fall asleep. But when heat is applied, in order to bring the person back to life, there's a rush of pain. As the heat begins to disseminate to the parts of the body that are freezing. And that pain is uncomfortable. And that pain is not pleasant. You see, my brothers and sisters, many times in the spiritual life, we are freezing to death. We are going by the ways of the world. And we're going into the quiet darkness of the evil one. And God sends the prophet to speak a word to us. And sometimes that word is like the heat that is applied to the physical life. And it's the spiritual heat, the power of the Holy Spirit that's applied to the spiritual life. And oftentimes, my friends, it is not comfortable, but it is needed. It is needed, my brothers and sisters, so that you and I may be the disciples that the Lord Jesus has called us to be. So that you and I may be a people of hope and a people of faith and a people of charity and a people of trust and a people who are faithful to the divine plan. So you see, my brothers and sisters, instead of seeing a prophet as a killjoy, I propose this. If God sends a prophet, if God sends a prophetic message, it means there is still hope. Why? Because if God didn't care, my brothers and sisters, he wouldn't send a prophet. 
If God was not concerned about our salvation, he would not send a prophet to lead us back to him. So we may convert of our ways, so we may change our hearts, that we may have the trust that we need, no matter how heavy the cross may be, or how difficult the challenge or crisis that we face. God sends a prophet to bring hope. The mouthpiece of God, an instrument of hope. And you see, my brothers and sisters, Ezekiel, from our first reading, faced a very difficult task. Because Ezekiel was called at a time in which the Jewish people were at their lowest. And I think, my friends, all of us can relate to that at this moment. Here's the history. The people of Israel, the kingdom had been destroyed. The nation had been disseminated by the Babylonians. The Jewish temple was no more. The city of Jerusalem laid in ruins... And the people were taken in exile to Babylon, to a foreign country, present-day Iraq. And it was to these people who had lost everything that God sent Ezekiel to speak to them. To deliver a message of hope to them in these trying times. Can you imagine that, my brothers and sisters? Can you imagine being a refugee, living in poverty in a strange land? Many of us, my brothers and sisters, we're on home confinement. We may think of ourselves as a little as a refugee because we're not about our normal work and our normal business and able to visit with relatives and friends. The center of their worship had been destroyed. The temple was no more. Certainly our churches have not been physically destroyed but were unable to gather as a community of faith around the altar of our God to celebrate the Eucharist because of these trying times. The Jewish community had been scattered. And I know there are many people who are longing to be able to see the people that they know. Their family members, their co-workers, their neighbors. A longing in the heart. Can you imagine these people, my friends, asking the question, where is our family? Where are our neighbors? How do we rebuild when everything has been taken away from us? My brothers and sisters, does that sound like a familiar story? But you see, my friends, the life of the Jewish people was rooted in their worship, in their identity as being God's chosen people. And so did this mean, since everything was destroyed, did this mean that God had ended his covenant with the nation of Israel? And that's an important question. And that's why God sends Ezekiel. He sends Ezekiel to these desperate and broken people to answer that very question. Has God abandoned us? Now, our first reading was only a very short section from chapter 37 from the prophet Ezekiel. But I want to read to you a little bit more so that we can understand what God says to Ezekiel and what Ezekiel is called to prophesy. Because it means so much, my brothers and sisters, in the world in which we live right here, right now, today. It reads this. The hand of the Lord was on me. And he, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord. And set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them. And I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley. Bones that were very dry. The Lord asked me, son of man, can these bones live? I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know. My friends, do you and I feel like we're in the valley of dry bones? Do you and I look around us and see the death and the illness and the suffering and the destruction? My friends, we are in the valley of dry bones. And God asks Ezekiel an important question. Son of man, can these bones live? Now that's a question worth asking, my friends. Because basically, the Lord says to Ezekiel, is there any hope for that nation, for that relationship, for your family, for your future. Is there any hope? And then God said to Ezekiel, 
prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. I love that sentence. Hear the word of the Lord, because the word of the Lord, my friends, is powerful. God says in the book of Genesis, let there be light, and there was light. And so today, my brothers and sisters, I say to you, hear the word of the Lord. Because the word of the Lord is a word of hope, and it's a word of promise. It's not a word of abandonment, and it's not a word of exile, and it's not a word of hopelessness, but it's a word of hopefulness. The word of the Lord is a life-giving word. Then God says to Ezekiel, this is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. This is what God is saying to all of us right now, my friends. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life, and then you will know that I am the Lord. That's what God is doing right now, my brothers and sisters. Even in this time of great suffering and trial and pain, he is bringing those bones back together. He is reminding us what is important. He is asking us, where are we in our relationship with the Lord Jesus? So what does Ezekiel do? He prophesies. He follows the Lord's commands. And those bones begin to come together. Those bones begin to rattle. They come off the valley floor. You know that old song, them bones, them bones, them Dry bones, them bones, them bones, them dry bones, them bones, them bones, them dry bones. Oh, hear the word of the Lord. The toe bones connected to the foot bone. The foot bones connected to the leg bone. The leg bones connected to the knee bone. The knee bones connected to the thigh bone. The thigh bones connected to the back bone. The back bones connected to the neck bone. The neck bones connected to the head bone, oh, hear the word of the Lord. That's what God's saying to us. No matter where our bones are scattered, no matter how many pieces our life's in right now, no matter how scared we may be, hear the word of the Lord. God's bringing those bones back together. He's putting flesh and tendons on them. And suddenly Ezekiel looked and he sees the bones coming together. He sees them covered in skin. But there is no breath of life in them. And so the voice of God then says, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. My brothers and sisters, God wants to breathe in us the breath of life. He wants to send the Holy Spirit upon us this day into our own hearts to hear the word of the Lord, to experience a spiritual renewal, to, no matter, to know that no matter what difficulty we face, no matter what the problem is, God is greater. Open your hearts, my brothers and sisters, this day to hear the word of the Lord, to allow the breath, the gift of the Holy Spirit to penetrate your heart and mind. And so Ezekiel does what he's commanded. And the breath comes into these bodies and they form an army that stand at the feet of Ezekiel. Can you see that in your imagination, my brothers and sisters? The army is standing there. That is all of us. Part of the church militant. The church here on earth. Going through our daily lives, trying to be faithful, even in the midst of suffering and hardship, sickness and death. ...that we see all around us. Then God said to Ezekiel... ...son of man... ...these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up... ...and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy to them and say... ...this is what the sovereign Lord says. So my brothers and sisters... ...if you feel cut off this day... ...if you feel that you've lost hope... Ezekiel has a word for you. God has a word for you. This is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves. And bring you out of them. We might feel, my brothers and sisters, at this moment, like Lazarus in the tomb from the gospel. When Jesus says, roll back that stone. 
And Martha says, oh no, there's going to be a stench. And we might say to ourselves, Father Cooper, there's just too much stenches out there. There's just too much suffering out there. But Jesus says, roll that stone away. And what does he do? He first gives thanks to the Father. My brothers and sisters, even in this time, can we give thanks to God? And he says, Lazarus, come out. My people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live. And I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I am the Lord and that I have spoken and that I have done it, declares the Lord. My brothers and sisters, doesn't that make you want to dance? Doesn't that make you want to shout for joy? Wherever you're watching today, in your living room, in your bedroom, you can go ahead and dance because people are not going to say, oh, look at that crazy Catholic out there. Go ahead and dance because God has a good word to speak to us this day. That which was dead will be brought back to glorious life. That which was out hope will be restored to vitality and purpose. Oh, hear the word of the Lord. You know, in 1980, Mount St. Helen erupted. And it was a terrible eruption. It brought death and destruction to the plant life and the vegetation. The rivers were clogged with mud and clay. Animals were killed. And many scientists believe that the area would take years, if not generations, to come back. But the Lord had a different story. And that next year, salmon made their way, going back upstream in about six inches of water in order to spawn, to bring back life. And all of a sudden, the soil became more rich because of the nutrients from the volcano, volcanic eruption. Life began to return. And the mountain was healthier and stronger and more teeming with life than it was before the eruption. You see, my brothers and sisters, don't ever call a situation hopeless. Not as long as you're a follower of Jesus. This is a world in which we are never, ever beyond hope. Those dry bones can yet come together and live once more. So you see, my friends, where is there hope in the valley of dry bones? We find hope in this. God always keeps his promises. Always. God always keeps his promises. That which was spoken through the prophets, he has kept. That which was spoken by our Lord and Savior Jesus, our Messiah, our Redeemer and our King, he has kept. God always keeps his promises. If God tells you everything's going to turn out okay, it's going to turn out okay. Because we need to trust in those promises. Because when did God make the first promise to the people of Israel, to the nation of Israel? It goes back to Genesis 12, when God told an old childless man named Abram to leave his country and his people and go to the land that I will show you. And God was faithful to his promises. He was faithful to the people of Israel. Because what did God say to Abram? I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you. I will bless your name and make it great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all people on the earth will be blessed through you. Where is our part in that, my friends? All people of the earth will be blessed through you? How is that going to happen? Well, God sent his only son, our Lord Jesus Christ, through the lineage of Abraham and the nation of Israel to make a new covenant in his blood. 
and would offer salvation and new life to all people on the earth. That's why you and I are here today, my friends. We are included in God's promise, and God is always faithful to that promise. A few years ago, I was celebrating a funeral mass. And during the visitation, as often as custom, they were giving out holy cards. And as I was looking at the holy card, there was a picture, a religious picture on the front, but on the back, instead of there being a eulogy or information from the deceased, or on the deceased, or even a prayer, it was blank except for the bottom. At the bottom were the words, because I said I would. Because I said I would. Now, I thought that was a little strange. I wasn't quite sure what was going on until the son of the man who had died gave the words of remembrance. And he said his father was an ordinary man. But one thing his father always was faithful to was his commitment. If he committed to something, you could count on that he would do it. And one of his famous lines was, because I said I would. And so the son went on to say that he was giving out these cards that he was calling promise cards. And he was encouraging people to write down a promise on those cards. And remember that last line, because I said I would, to be faithful to that promise. Someone was telling me recently that they were using this idea. It was a nurse in an assisted living facility. And one of the promises she made was that she was going to go every day during the week that she worked and she was going to have lunch with one of the elderly residents. Now this woman was suffering from dementia so she would often forget that the nurse would say, I'll be back tomorrow to have lunch with you. So she gave her one of these promise cards so she could read and she wrote on it, I will be there every day to eat lunch with you. And at the bottom it says, because I said so. And the next day, when she arrived for lunch, the elderly woman was clutching that card in her hand. And there was a big smile on her face when the nurse walked in and she said, You remembered. You see, my brothers and sisters, God says the same thing to us. Because I said so. I am faithful to my promises. What does it say in 2 Chronicles? The Lord appeared to Solomon during the night and said, If my people upon whom my name has been pronounced, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways. I will hear them from heaven, pardon their sins, and heal their land. What are some of the promises that Jesus makes in the gospel? Come to me, all you who are weary and find life burdensome, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your soul. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. If you love me and keep my commandments, I will ask the Father, and he will send you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I come so that you may have life and have it more abundantly. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me shall not die, but have life eternal. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Teach these disciples to obey all that I commanded you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Hear God's promises, hold on to God's promises. Because you see, my brothers and sisters, as more and more people become ill, and as more and more people die, and as more and more people face financial heartache and hardship, as more and more people become desperate and lonely and feel isolated and depressed, the Lord has a word for us. He is always faithful to his promises, and he is going to find a way, and he is going to provide. And if we feel that we're in the valley of dry bones, 
Hear the word of the Lord. It is a life-giving word. It is a healing word. And it's a word, my friends, that the Lord Jesus desires us to be able to be a people of hope. You know, as that old spiritual says, there is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. Sometimes I feel discouraged, amen, and think my work's in vain. But then the Holy Spirit revives my soul again. Don't ever feel discouraged. For Jesus is your friend. And if you lack of knowledge or faith or hope this day, he'll never refuse to lend. And if you cannot preach like Peter, amen, and if you cannot pray like Paul, you can tell the love of Jesus and say he died for all. You see, my brothers and sisters, the Lord wants to heal us. He wants to revive us. He wants to heal whatever is sin-sick in us this day, whatever is broken in us this day, whatever in us is in the valley of dry bones. And if your life is smashed this day, if you feel like that all that exists of you is laying there, on the floor, hear the word of the Lord. Allow the Lord to breathe life into you. And have hope, my friends, that nothing, absolutely nothing, is impossible for our God. And so, my friends, I invite you to stand <clears throat> as we profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. And by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. I believe, I believe in the, in the Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. My dear friends, with faith and hope in our hearts, let us present our prayers and petitions to God, our loving Father. Please respond, Lord, hear our prayer. That our Holy Father, Pope Francis, our Archbishop Gregory Amon, the bishops, priests, deacons, and all who serve the church may be ministers of healing and compassion. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the public policies and laws of our nation may protect all life from conception until natural death, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the Spirit of God may dwell in every dimension of our lives together as a church and parish family, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all countries and communities, 
who have experienced loss and crisis due to this coronavirus, that they may, that through our compassionate prayers and acts of charity, we may transform our heartaches into joy and our despair into hope. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For doctors, nurses, emergency care responders, and medical researchers, that their skills and insights, many will be restored to health. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the vulnerable and the fearful, for the gravely ill and the dying, that they may know your comfort and peace. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us also pray this day for the sick, for all those who are on our parish's sick list. <clears throat> We also pray for those who have died because of the coronavirus, for all those who will return to God during this Lenten season. May they awaken and arise in the light of Christ. We pray to the Lord. Uh, Lord, hear our prayer. For the prayers that we hold in the quiet and silence of our own individual hearts. For these prayers, for the many prayers that we have received from our parishioners, for the healing of our Archbishop, for all those who are in need of hope this day, we pray to the Lord. Uh, Lord good and gracious God, we present to you these our prayers and petitions, the few spoken this day, the many that remain the quiet of our individual hearts. We ask you grant them as only you know best, through your most holy and divine will, through Christ our Lord. Lord of all joy, whose trust ever childlike, no cares could destroy, be there at our waking, and give us, we pray, your place in our hearts, Lord, at the break of the day. Lord of all eagerness, Lord of all faith, who strong hands were skilled at the plain and the lake. And give us, we pray, your strength in our hearts, Lord, at the noon of the day. Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, our almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the glory of his name, for all the good and good of all of his holy church. Hear us, almighty God, and having instilled in your servants the teachings of the Christian faith, graciously purify them by the working of the sacrifice through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For as true man he wept for Lazarus his friend, and as eternal God raised him from the dead, just as taking pity on the human race, he leads us by sacred mysteries to new life. Through him the host of angels adore your majesty and rejoice in your presence forever. May our voices, we pray, join with theirs in one chorus of exultant praise as we acclaim. Sanctus, 
Sanctus, Sanctus Dominus Deus Sabao, plenes sun shall he at terra, gloria tua, osana in excelsis, benedictus, quid venit in nomine domini, osana in excelsis. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the font of all holiness. Make holy there for these gifts we pray by sending down your spirit upon them like the dewfall, so they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed, and did willingly to his passion, he took bread, and giving thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice. And once more, giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Morden tua, annunciamos Domine, et tua resurrectionem confitemos, Domine venias. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks you've held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray, and partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world, and bring it to the fullness of charity. Gather Francis, our Pope, and Gregory, our Bishop, the Order of Bishops, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters that have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection. And all who have died in your mercy, welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her most chaste spouse, with the blessed apostles, the holy martyrs, Saint Faustina, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Remain with them and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command and form of divine teaching, we dare to say, Our, Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil. Grace, we grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. 
Lord Jesus Christ said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church and graciously grant your peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord uh, be with you always. And with your spirit. On your stay, qui tollis peccata mundi, miserere nobis. On your stay, qui tollis peccata mundi, miserere nobis. On your stay, Qui tollis peccata mundi, dona nobis pace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, Lord I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my, my soul, soul shall, shall be healed. healed. My soul is thirsting for you, O oh Lord, thirsting for you, my God. My soul is thirsting for you, O oh Lord, thirsting for you, my God. Thirsting for you, my So this time, my brothers and sisters, I invite wherever you are that you kneel as we make our act of spiritual communion, and I invite you to repeat after me. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most blessed sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I, I embrace you as if you were already here and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Through the day you walked with me, all the night your love surrounds me. To the glory of your name, I lift my hands, I sing your praise. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord, thirsting for you, my God. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord, thirsting for you, my God. Thirsting for you, my God. I will never be afraid. For I will not be abandoned Even when the long road grows weary Your love will rescue me My soul is thirsty
thirsting for you, O Lord, thirsting for you, my God. My soul is thirsting for you, O Lord, thirsting for you. Let us pray. We pray, Almighty God, that we may always be counted among the members of Christ, in whose body and blood we have communed, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Certainly, my brothers and sisters, for those who are joining us, our parishioners, for those who are in this local church in and of New Orleans, from other dioceses, and throughout the world, be assured of our prayers this day for all of you. Be assured that each and every day we lift up your intentions and your prayers before the altar of our God. And we pray God's blessing upon you. We invite you to certainly continue to visit the parish's website at www.divinemercyparish.org for the latest information on parish operations as well as other resources and videos to help strengthen us along this journey. Certainly on behalf of myself, Deacon Boo, and Deacon Luis, and all of us here at Divine Mercy Parish, we wish you God's blessing this day. And we know, my brothers and sisters, because we are a people of faith and a people of hope, that God is always going to provide. And even in times of great despair, may we never let our fear overcome our faith. The Lord be with you and, and with, with your, your spirit. spirit. Bow your head for the blessing. Bless, O oh Lord, your people who long for the gift of your mercy and grant that what at your prompting they desire they may receive by your generous gift through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you abundantly, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Glorify the Lord by your life. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God.
for a God, the Lord of all creation, the Lord, the giver of life.